All right, so we're back at it with volcanoes, and um, I did rearrange the slides a little bit. Uh, for you folks at home, I just told uh, the folks here on campus all about it. Um, I just put uh, the Pohoi Hoi, uh, uh, a lot of stuff, uh, much closer to the middle of the conversation here uh, that we're going to start now, um, and the uh, other stuff is, I didn't delete anything or add anything. I just rearranged the slides a little bit, so no worries. Okay. Things you can make out of lava. I've been saying for 20 some years I got to come up with a better title than that. I guess I'm not going to. Um, but as you'll see, that really is uh, what we're going to talk about. But lava features, you know, is really what they are, but that just that sounded like it needed definition. So, pretty rocks, waterfall. Out west somewhere, right? That's about all we can tell from this picture. The more you stare at it, the more you start to get some scale. Uh, on the terrace just above the uh, waterfall to the left, there is a set of spires. I don't really want to call them mesas, but uh, right there. And if you spend any time watching Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner there, I'm not quite sure. Those are tall enough for him to fall off of and, and make himself a pancake out of. But that's a looks to be a pretty sizable set of rocks. This is a, a hell of a sequence here. All right. Um, so let's not worry about the Columbia part right now. Um, let's talk more about the flood basalt. We mentioned that not every uh, volcanic eruption or volcanic event leads to a big point of mountain. Uh, sometimes the earth just cracks open and bleeds, right? And that's, um, I, I used the word fissure eruption at the time when we mentioned it. But there could be a scale, as with everything in life. There's, there's, there's scales, there's levels of things. When we move up to the level of flood basalts, it's a pretty bad wound. Um, from the very bottom of this picture, and probably below, we just can't see it, all the way up through and all the way into the back drop is all lava. It's a lot of lava. Add to that that this covers a, a good part of uh, three or four states. I forget the exact. Um, so it's uh, it's out west. It's in the Four Corners area, which is why I think it is four states. But nonetheless, so um, yeah. I can't tell you how long this went on. I'm sure someone has dated it. Igneous rocks are great for uh, getting dates out of. Um, so we could have some really, really exacting numbers here. But I think you guys could even imagine without us doing the geological time chapter that that's a lot of lava. And that's probably a lot of time. Okay. So flood basalts. Um, there's, there's several flood basalts throughout the world. If you... Um, Nobody really knows them. Uh, if, you, if you read a lot about dinosaurs when you were a kid, you might know the Dakon Traps. Uh, they're over in Asia, uh, and they are one of the things that they're looking at for uh, the time the dinos died out. It happened right around the same time, and a volcanic event of that size could certainly, you know, cloud up the sky enough to cause some some problems. This one did, you know, as well, undoubtedly. So. Um, but there are more than just this one, okay? And it's not in Colombia, South America. You know, it's just Colombia. It's the area, Columbia River. I want to say it's associated with. I should probably know. So that's one lava feature. Another lava feature is a lava dome. A lava dome. You heard a little bit about lava domes just in passing, watching the St. Helens video. Uh, they said a dome had formed. All right. Um, I've always viewed this really just as the, the top of the volcano being sealed off. But even thinking back to that crazy video we watched at the end of last lecture, um, instead of a, a molten bottom there, it could have uh, certainly been domed down in there. And at some point, that will probably cool off and, and crust up. Um, these are, generally speaking, bad. You're like, well, we don't want the lava to come out. 
Yeah, but you don't want all that pressure and everything to build up either. Um, this is more than just a cork in a champagne bottle. This is because of the way the rock uh, grows or cool, cools and grows. This is like, uh, imagine if the lid on that champagne bottle sort of grew organically out of the side of the bottle and sealed itself off. All right. Um, there is no easy, you know, just pop it open a little bit kind of thing. This is a solid seal, which again makes it worse because that allows pressure and stuff to build up. Um, this is kind of what happened with St. Helens, as I started to say. And um, in their instance, it might have almost been a, a mixed blessing. Um, it found the weak spot, didn't happen to be out the top. All right, it was unidirectional, for lack of a better word. It blew out one side. Now, that also helped to take a lot of the, uh, the mountain with it. Okay, but um, if that had been straight out the top, we would have seen a much different sort of uh, radius happening. Okay. Um, the other thing with Lava Dome is that um, we're going to see a vocabulary word a little later. Um, we're going to come back to these, but they, they're, they're not good. They're not good. So a Lava Dome. The lava cools, sort of naturally corks itself into place, and it can lead to some, some trouble. The next word is columnar jointing, columnar, columnar jointing. And what you're supposed to be looking at are these uh, hexagonal sort of stepping stone looking things. Okay. And this is the tippy top. I'm going to jump to a side view real quick. There's six big, long hexagonal telephone poles. There's a famous set of these. You may have heard of the Devil's Tower. A student mentioned this one to me one semester. I hadn't heard of it. Arguably much cooler than Devil's Tower. There's a video game I used to play called Cubers. You guys might know Cubers. Um, I'll go sit in the background and remind you of what he was talking about. But very cool looking. So what happens... Oops. I'm going to leave it on the Devil's Tower thing for a minute. Uh, you remember your diagram of the volcano that you drew, right? And you drew a skinny little tube through your cone. We call that the vent pipe. And we said that somewhere down below was the uh, magma chamber, the lava chamber that, that filled all of this. Well, that drawing wasn't exactly the scale either. Okay. I've actually been here. I'm pretty sure this is my picture. It's been in my slide shows too long. Um, but I think this uh, I was there a long, 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 long time ago before um, digital cameras. I'm really surprised I didn't have the date mode set on my camera because, uh, you know, we did have that back then. We printed out the film. Um, there's a sign here that says when there was a volcano here, it was well above the top of this tower. So this is basically one of those vent pipes, okay? And... Um, the, the, the surrounding rock, sedimentary -ish stuff, is, is a lot more, a lot less durable than this igneous rock stuff. So all that weathering and erosion has, has worn away over the, over the centuries and um, left this, this sort of monolith standing there. So they sometimes you'll hear the word volcanic neck, okay? But this is deep down, usually beneath the volcano even, or at least in this case. And once all that material is removed, there's nothing really supporting it anymore. So it starts to uh, succumb to weathering and erosion itself. And the first thing that happens is it starts to, it, it relaxes, so to speak, and it starts to crack. And for whatever reason, uh, in this scenario, uh, basalt uh, cracks into these hexagonal cylinders. It's really funky. Why do you think that hammer's there? Anyway, everybody. Hmm? Yeah. Mm, maybe. I heard a female voice over here somewhere. To break it down? Well, you're both on the same track. No. 
Well, that is a rock hammer. Yeah, that's totally a rock hammer. That, that's not the. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of, and see, this is why I bring this up. A lot of people go through life thinking that geologists are like really lazy photographers or something. Um, well, or you want to get a fresh piece to look at. Those are all good field techniques, but that's still not why this hammer's here. I didn't say why they bring one on their trip. Why is that one there? Nothing's placement. Ooh, there we go. Finally, we got a winner. Scale. Scale. So, if you're in the know, which you guys obviously aren't, uh, so that's an S-wing hammer. If you've got a, a, a someone you know that's in construction, they make really good hammers, even for just like pounded nails. But they are the, you know, like cool hammer to have if you're a, a geologist. Uh, you know that that comes in two lengths, okay? And looking at the amount of metal between the uh, the handle there and the head, you know that's the the normal size one, the short one, so to speak. And it is exactly used for scale, uh, because when you go out there, you take dozens, hundreds, and hundreds of pictures. And sure, you take field notes, but putting those notes back with the pictures, it's not so easy. You guys are growing up in a world where you can put notes with a picture automatically, digitally, all in one. No, it used to be a disaster. Believe me. And every time they go to a conference, they've got these cool little plastic rulers. I've got about 12 in my desk. It's a Geological Society of America, and they've got a scale bar on it and everything. Yeah, we leave them in our desks or in the car when we go out hiking. But they generally do remember their rock hammers. You'll see lens caps. You'll see pencils. Anything that's sort of standardized. And that way, anybody on the planet who's in a position to know can know. All my pictures tend to have my foot in them because I don't even bring my rock hammer anymore. But uh, scale. And that's actually important, taking field notes. So columnar jointing. Devil's Tower, Giants Causeway, cool places. Speaking of for scale, people are generally useless for scale. This is probably a tallish person, I would say. It looks like looks like they have long legs. But you know, people aren't really good for scale. So doubtless I doubt this is a tourist. This is probably, you know, one of their colleagues. Um, and also you can tell by those cool buckskin boots with the red laces that everybody wore a hundred years ago. The lava tube. So many of my references are so dated. But you guys remember on Windows, they used to have a screensaver that was like pipe that would go in. You get into a generation that's never seen the pipe screensaver. It's kind of the same thing with Starfield. Starfield was awesome. All right, well, so it was this ongoing, supposedly random connection with pipes. Um, and it would just continue to, to build and then reset and then make more pipe work and so on and so forth. Another thing you might be familiar with are those uh, paper yo-yos. Uh, the paper wrapped up on a, on a stick and you go like this and it goes and it whips out and then ideally comes back. All right, what we're going for here is some sort of mental image of lava flowing into water. Wait for it, it is coming because you don't see the connection yet, I'm sure. The outside hits the water and crystallizes immediately, makes that tube. The inside keeps flowing. And then as soon as that flows through the pipe, that crystallizes, that flows through the pipe. So it makes this pipe work, and then it eventually runs itself free, runs itself through. So if this were, say, at the top of Mount Everest right now, this one isn't, obviously, you know, but if this were, we'll just say top of a mountain, we know that lava tubes have to form in water. And that's how we see them happening now. That's the only way we could really conceive of them happening. Um, sure, there's always that other weird outside possibility something could happen. But generally speaking, we know this happens. So you would then have to work into your assessment the idea that, okay, when this happened, this area was underwater. 
Um, and this is something we're going to start doing in here slowly but surely. We don't, I, I say at the beginning of the semester, we don't have a whole lot of uh, opportunity for recurring fees. Um, but one we do get to do is um, how we read the past, the tools we use to read the past. We're not just making this crap up when they tell you a lot of this stuff. Um, so we're going to see over the next couple, several weeks uh, how geologists can read the rock. In knowing that this only forms, this feature only forms in water, can certainly help inform you. Limestone is a great, another great example. Um, limestone only forms not just in water, but in salt water. So anywhere you see limestone, you know it had to have been covered with salt water and ocean at some point. All right, so anyhow, let's start there again. Um, so a lava tube, all right. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's just me, maybe I see a hint of water in the background there, but it does look like we're, we're coastal right now. So there's not a whole lot of guessing or clues, you know, that we need to infiltrate here. Um, the bottom looks wet, but it, it could have just rained. Uh, it still could be affected by tides, though. But to me, through that tunnel there, it does sort of look like a uh, uh, sort of rocky shore there. Um, this slide in particular, I told you that a lot of these I've been using for a very long time. This one has really uh, been with me the whole time, and it uh, sort of comes off as, as, as uh, being an example of how technology changes things. So when I first started showing this slide, it was probably an overhead. Remember overhead projectors? I don't miss them, but I was blind in them. Um, and then we went to slides. Slides, and slides are actually older than overheads, but I always hated slides and getting carousels and they stick and jam. They're a pain in the butt. So we got projectors, finally. Uh, the, the, the computer, right? Um, and so I would, uh, you see that ledge there, right? This is where I'm going with this. So this person is staring at the wall, possibly the ledge, I don't know. Um, and somebody asked about the ledge. I'm like, oh, well. Uh, I don't really exactly know. Let's make so make a lo logical story up here. I'm like, well, this is probably at, at the uh, tide line, and um, you know that's weathering and erosion over thousands of years, wearing out the bottom. We could, you know, figure out where tide level, highest tide level is, so on and so forth. Then one day I came in, new semester, new conversation, and I realized that that was a ledge, not an indentation, because the resolution got better or the lighting got better, or who knows what. It's an old picture, the picture didn't get better. So I had to change my story. Um, in Earth science we talk about this a lot because astronomy constantly changes as the telescopes got better and better and better and we started looking at different spectrums and they're constantly updating, not necessarily changing their minds, but updating with the new information. And technology does that Engineering is, you know, very important. I get that. Um, technology and engineering um, do that for us over and over again, but we don't have a whole lot of opportunity in the classroom usually to actually experience that. But this was indeed uh, that. So what I think happened here is, is one of two things. Um, either this was sort of augmented for tourists, as in the bottom was dug out a little bit. That top looks awfully chiseled out. But uh, it could also be slow running. It could be slow running. Um, or, again, you want to think about that lava tube filling itself out and then eventually the eruption stops and it runs, runs out. Um, this might just have been, you know, the end flow there. Um, and it was just, you know, it wasn't enough to fill the whole tube, kind of trickling through at the end, uh, so on and so forth. So there's a couple different things going on here. but. Uh, but I swear to you, for the first 10 years I used this slide, that looked like it was an indention instead of a, a ledge. Hello, basalts. Another tourist in the way. This one kind of works, because we know the size of an average head at any rate. Um, so we can get an idea of roughly how big those are. I usually go for beanbag size. I would call them um, beanbag basalts myself. I like the alliteration as well, so you got the bees going. Uh, but they call them pillow basalts. 
Uh, these two form underwater. Um, what happens is sort of the jacuzzi effect, I like to say, um, because nobody likes my uh, rabbit suit conversation. So uh, we're going to go with jacuzzi for right now. Um, you've seen a jacuzzi. If you've not been in one, you've seen one. You get the idea that there's these jets around it, and they shoot uh, air through or sometimes water. Um, and what happens is the water pressure sort of envelops, because you don't like it when I say pinches off either, but it pinches off the air bubble, you get this bubble coming out. That's, that's what a bubble is, it's air, right? So this lava is underwater. How much water? Well, someone can tell you who studies these, but enough water pressure that as this flow is coming out, the pressure goes whoop, and a little ball of lava falls to the side. And then the next one comes out and it clips that off and that rolls to the side. And these just build up around the vent. If you've ever seen a rabbit poop, imagine, or a ghost. Ghosts are about the same way. All right, those little piles of pellets piling up behind them. All right, it's the same idea. Except the water serves as the sphincter muscle in this case. So this guy could be up a hill somewhere. But we know that not only was this area underwater, but under a decent amount of water that it uh, had enough water pressure to to pinch off the lava flows as they came through. What kind of rock is that? Good. Okay, you should have all answered that. Be happy for the few times when we make things simple in life, okay? So mainly been looking at basalt. Anyhow, but, uh, you know, heck, they threw the, the name in here. But arguably, you know, there's three kinds of lava, right? You've got your basalt, you've got your rhyolite, and you got the one in the middle there, you got andesite, okay? But this is a thing. So it's not rhyolite. Now I know what you're thinking. We talked about pyroclasts already, and we said that ash is a great example of pyroclast. And well, ash isn't lava. Well, yeah, that's how it starts. All right. Remember, you've got that that gases sputtering through this volcano as it's erupting, and the splashes, if you would. All right. That's what turns into these pyroclasts. So when there's enough pressure and so on and so forth, they can make a very fine mist, so to speak. That's your ash. But the bigger blurbs and blobs that go bouncing off. Okay. Now there's there's three sizes of pyroclast. I don't have a slide for it. I, I don't know, honestly know why. Uh, there's ash, cinders with a C, and blocks or bombs. Blocks as in like you build with blocks. And bombs with a, a B. Somebody raised their hand one time and said, Did you say bombs? No, that's not where bombs come from. Blocks and bombs, boom. Um, these, Hollywood loves these when they make movies, okay? Um, it's very picturesque as these things come cruising down to the earth and go through car tops and land on people and everything. Um, and as you saw in the video the other day, they can be, you know, that dramatic. Uh, luckily, a lot of times they're not. Sometimes they are. Uh, a friend of mine uh, had the luck, whatever, to travel to um, uh, Italy a couple summers back. And uh, they went to the uh, museum at, at Pompeii and uh, sent me some pictures. You guys are familiar, I'm sure, with the story. Um, the town was covered in ash. It's a lot of ash, okay? Uh, in order to cover a whole town, and it seemingly came rather quickly. People were caught in various modes, uh, you know, of uh, there's stories, you know, the soldiers still at their station. All right, well, soldiers are going to be soldiers. I, I think I probably would have deserted my post, to be honest, but uh, I wasn't a Roman soldier ever, so there you go. Um, but um, some people were still found in bed and stuff like that. So 
seemingly it happened rather rather quickly, sort of donkey sort of animal here. I don't think the cloud runs are very long. So that can happen with ash, not just a, a dusting that turned everything gray like it did in the Mount St. Helens video. Uh, sometimes it can be significantly worse. Uh, we didn't say it at the time, but biggest to smallest, ash, cinder, block, bomb, which way is that going? Ash is the smallest, block or bomb is the, the bigger. Your textbook's going to give you diameters, not, nothing you need to worry about, okay? Cinders, uh, a picture, you know, a bonfire size, as the bonfire's dying down and you have what we would call usually cinders, okay, that's usually about the size of cinder. Blocks and bombs can be as big as they want to be. Um, difference between a block and a bomb, a block is angular, a bomb is more streamlined. Why do they care? I don't know. But they do. Questions about pyroclastic material before we move on, or even lava feces before we move on, because we're kind of changing gears here. All right, so I got two more things that really just, I guess they weren't their own slide, but uh, beyond that, they don't really fit into any one uh, category. I mentioned we'd touch back on um, volcanic dome. All right, and this first one here, Nue Arzente, was supposed to be a little on, uh, possibly on one of those E's in the Nue. I think that's where it goes. It's French. Uh, supposedly it's French for glowing cloud. Anybody take French in high school? I'm not even sure if we offer it here, but I don't think we do. Wow. All right, so we're going to have to believe that it's French for glow glowing cloud. Um, that would be if Disney sort of named it. Um, I don't even think if you were five miles away on another hill and watching it. I prefer flaming cloud of death. Um, th these are horrible. Absolutely horrible. Um, so I told you that the, the dome is a really tight seal. Well, sometimes you can have this, this volcanic fart, for lack of a better word, where it just it cracks and all this gas that's built up. In some ways, you might think this is good. We escaped a huge eruption. But this gas is, is boiling hot. It's very dense and heavy. If you go back and you look at the composition of some volcanic gases, they're way heavier than air. So... This boiling hot cloud of gas uh, comes just trucking down the side of a mountain, oftentimes hundreds of miles per hour. It's under extreme pressures, right? Um, and it doesn't really even matter that it is poisonous in the end because of the, the temperature. And, you know, there's just these things have just totally wiped out villages and towns at the bases of, of volcanoes over the, the centuries, uh, there's stories of it. Um, just just horrible things. So glowing cloud. Uh, and Lahar, I'm finally starting to see Lahar, but I, I think the, the word is Lahars, that's not plural. I think they just have an S on the end of it. Again, it's not a, an American word, so they could have an S without pluralizing, I suppose. Um, this is a volcanic mud flow, for lack of a better word. Remember the before picture on St. Helens? What was the top of this mountain covered in? Snow. And some of you know this, some of you don't. Uh, but below the snow, we have something called a what line? Usually. What do we start to see after the mountain uh, is done being snow-capped majesty? It turns back into... Trees and vegetation and all that, okay? A tree line is what they call that. So this thing blows its top. That snow melts almost instantly, right? Then you've got ash coming out, mixes in with that slurry. You've got all the soil and the trees and whatnot that's just below all that previously ice. And that comes trucking on down the side of the mountain. All right, and again, destroying just about anything in its path. 
Um, they talked about some of these. They showed the effects of some of these in uh, the St. Helens video. Heck, they didn't even have lava flowing for Mount St. Helens, and look at all the damage that it did. All right. Yeah. Uh, the top one. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. What does it mean again? Uh, supposedly it means glowing cloud. Yes. And as I said, I prefer flaming cloud of death. That would translate a little differently, I think. More accurate. So Lahars is a volcanic mud flow, okay. Um, additionally, yeah. Yeah, it glow, you could. It, I don't have any pictures of them, but yeah, but, it, but from what I've understood, uh, you can see it, especially if it's at night. But yeah, and I imagine it's you know bright enough, hot enough that during the day, you know, you should be able to see it as, as well. I've never Googled pictures of of that. Somebody had to have caught one. Um, and there's also, you're going to see about ash flows, and, and I, I do need to update this a little bit, uh, expand a little bit more, but there's there's ash flows as well that kind of fall into the same. But this one is strictly gas, um, nasty, nasty gas. So uh, going back to this, so the other thing that happens, you get the primary from all the snow melting, but also a lot of times with this you see an increase in precipitation because of all the ash. It uh, allows, if you're in a moist area, okay, not a very arid environment, but you're in a rather moist area, all that ash particle serves as what they call condensation nuclei, uh, little bits to get the water vapor seeded, so to speak. They're literally seeding the clouds, all right? Uh, and you tend to get a lot of rain, which then adds to the mess. And, and as I said, they showed a lot of this in uh, St. Helens. These are sort of secondary uh, effectors. Um, the, uh, the ash certainly caused some damage, but like I said, there was no lava flowing. Uh, a lot of those deaths were mainly the flooding, because they weren't buried in ash. I have a picture of a Lahars. Maybe I did try and Google it, and just didn't find anything. I don't know, I, I Googled Lahars, obviously. So you see it coming down the side of the mountain there. Obviously, still plenty of snow on there. I'm not sure if these images you really would think that would have. Uh, we saw that white hot has that yellow volcano too. Um, might just be ash bubbles. I'm not sure what we're seeing. So Lahar. Lahar. Oh, I made a liar out of myself. So yeah, you can see that. Imagine at night it's a lot prettier. I updated this a semester or two back. I forget everything I updated it with. And I didn't cite this either. I don't remember. I don't know. It might have been uh, Wiki Commons. I do I do love the Wiki. All right, so we've just got a handful of uh, cartoons here at the end, some, some images to go back and touch on a couple things we talked about. Um, told you that shield volcanoes were really uh, low angle, wide base, uh, not too horribly. And this is just sort of showing you a cross section of that. Again, we drew a very simple volcano with one vent pipe. But whenever you're watching uh, some documentary on these, they talk about different um, flow points and so on and so forth, especially in these big guys. Um, you know, you're going to have a, an active area over to the on the west side, and maybe another active area over on the, the east side. Um, certainly, there is a central location and, and so on and so forth. But there's uh, quite typically some other multiple lava fields uh, going on. Uh, the cinder, I just kept this on here to show you a difference of size. I'm really not fond of it. We talked about lava, but we talked to you, of course, 
that uh, silver tones uh, are made of pyroclastic materials, hence the, um, you know, the use of the word cinder there. The lava splatters out, maybe I didn't make it 100% clear, but um, it's sputtering out and throwing the big chunks and the rest over that. So technically those are the pyroclasts that are flying out, and technically that is lava too, but by saying lava flow, I think that kind of contradicts the, the main point of this. But nonetheless, it's there for shape and size. All right, so I was telling you a little bit about this a couple minutes ago. Um, with St. Helen, the, uh, the, direction, the explosion went out one of the sides. And um, when they talk about how many uh, feet came off the top of the mountain, if you look at the last image there, C, uh, you can imagine if you blow out the side like that, that the top is most certainly going to come crumbling down on top of that, as much as going to hang there and make a nice little cave. Um, so that crumbled down, and it, it led to uh, it's a thousand feet, I think it says, thereabouts worth of. Uh, of elevation loss. But it'll build back up over time. This one's mainly here for the free picture, but uh, this is showing what can happen um, when the, the gas leaks out of the uh, of the dome. But this is a little too chaotic to call a new AR gun bay, at least I'm not comfortable doing that. But uh, it's a very cool picture nonetheless. All right. Uh, you remember Crater Lake? Talk about Crater Lake as part of the uh, Cascade Range. What's really cool about Crater Lake uh, isn't just the fact that it is a uh, caldera on the top of a mountain, um, but that there is another tiny little volcano growing in the center of it. And uh, this is a nice to show you sort of caldera formation as we go through picture A uh, to B. Uh, magma chamber uh, sort of empties out, the, uh, the volcano collapses in on itself, you're left with um, the, the uh, caldera that we talked about in picture C there, lower uh, left hand corner. All right. And over time, as pressure builds back up, any one of those uh, tubes can become active again. And in this case, it's uh, slowly but surely building up a new volcano uh, in the uh, center of the lake. And I'm sure we could come up with, uh, you know, sit and speculate a lot on the uh, origin story of, of its name, but uh, I'm sure we could also just imagine the locals um, making up stories over the centuries as they saw this, uh, you know, this island out in the middle of the lake occasionally, you know, burst into steam and, and uh, I don't know if it flows lava or just ash or whatever, but, you know, some crazy gold lizard or salmon or whoever lived out on that island stay away from it did kind of thing. Uh, and nowadays they just call it uh, Lizard Island. Adults are always making up cautionary tales, you know, on here. Oops. So the longer you look at this slide, the the more it comes into, not necessarily focus, but the more you realize what you're looking at. Uh, this gentleman's either from a neighboring town, or maybe he was away for the day, or uh, maybe everyone got out. It was a very long time ago, as you can tell. Uh, this is in over in the Caribbean area, which is also fairly uh, volcanic. Um, just about in the center of the picture, we've got a uh, what used to be a road. Right here. And then if you take that into perspective, you realize, okay, those were houses or structures of some sort, buildings. Over here was buildings. Here's docks. This is the coast. And uh, uh, that place was decimated. All right. And like I said, 
that hopefully they had an opportunity, some sort of notice, to uh, get away. I forget if this was late 18 or uh, early 19. for air. And going back to Disney for a minute, I could totally see them you know, making one of these in the lobby of the Polynesian, at least in the courtyard. Um, wouldn't it be so shiny and pretty and small and bubbly? What's that rock around there? Salt. Yeah, it's salt, so it's getting quicker than anything now. One day it'll be a big, bad, nasty volcano all on its own. But that takes a long time. All right, and then I did have the link embedded. I didn't realize that uh, for the video we watched the other day. You folks at home, if you haven't watched that video, please do so. It's, it's very cool. Uh, don't type very cool volcano video into YouTube. You won't get the uh, thing. Uh, either type this here or I have uh, provided a separate link uh, in the lecture folder, I believe. So, is there more stuff in the volcano chapter? Yeah. Okay. Um, did I give you enough of it? Yes, more than enough in my opinion. There's a huge reason I did not put this on the last test. Um, that's for this semester at any rate, if I use this in a subsequent semester. It's a lot of questions. It's a lot of vocabulary words. Okay, um, it's not quite enough to make itself its own test, but uh, please don't be, uh, don't blow this chapter off, okay, because uh, when the next test does roll around, um, there will be a couple dozen questions out of this, and, and you know, all fairness, it took us almost two whole lectures to talk about, we watched a, a movie about it as well, um, so we spent a lot of time on it, so I think it is fair that there's a lot of questions uh, on the test about it, but the same, it's a lot of vocabulary words. Anywho, if you are reading through the, when you are reading through the chapter, not if, um, if you come across some stuff that uh, we didn't talk about and you're wondering about, please, you know, always feel free to ask me. Uh, now that we're chapter-based, okay, uh, hopefully you guys have, have started opening the book. I know for the first part of the semester, I was skipping around like crazy, parts of this chapter, parts of that chapter. But ever since minerals, we've been chapter-based, okay? And especially if you're having a hard time with the tests. For many of you, just listening to my lectures, studying the PowerPoints is sufficient. Um, but for some of you looking for something else, okay, um, please make sure you spend some time with the chapter, but not the night before the test. That is not the time to read the chapter. Read it close to or around when we're talking about it in class. I don't come out and blatantly assign homework, but I've tried to make this clear several times, okay, that just because I don't assign the questions at the end of the chapter or the vocabulary words at the end of the chapter, that doesn't mean that I don't want you reading it. So, all right, anywho. That's the wrong thing to stop.